time is right, we are here, and who is next? You've done it, and you belong here, girl, and I'm really excited about that. Just to sit in the locker room and look across and you have, you know, people who are pioneers in the women's game, I think is just the coolest thing. There was a, a feeling for a long time that women could never be the draw. I couldn't be more passionate to change the game. There's little things you can do every single day to help empower others. I met Sammy Jo Small in 1997. I have known Sammy Jo for a very long time. From growing up in Winnipeg, Manitoba, I knew of her because she had played hockey against my older brother, Jason. And then I guess the next couple of decades uh, would forge a, a great relationship, a friendship, uh, a teammate, uh, and a lot, of, a lot of laughs along the way, let me tell you. Sammy came in with this style that was different and unique and, and had a lot of success right away. She became our number one goaltender in 1999 and 2000 and was MVPs of, I think, one if not both of those tournaments. So really, I think, solidified her role as a top goaltender in the world very quickly um, and really was, you know, responsible for a lot of the success we had in those years. I think what stands out for me is when we had the chance to walk into opening ceremonies and to enjoy closing ceremonies at the Olympic Games, that those were moments that both of us had dreamed about uh, as young kids and to have the chance to share that with such a close friend uh, remains an incredibly special memory for me. Whether she was a starting goaltender or whether she was the one that was coming in, you knew that she could make the big save coming in off the bench. You knew that she could make it when she was out there. She was a great teammate and she continues to, I think, grow the game and talk about the game and want to move the game forward. And um, that passion in her is something that just exudes when you talk to her. Well, Sammy, I am so happy to see you, albeit virtually. And I just want to offer you huge congratulations on this book. I loved it. It's so you, it is so candid. It is very thorough very heartfelt. Uh, I know it's been a long time coming, over a decade in the making. What does it feel like to actually put it out there in the world? It is, it's strange. Um, first of all, Tara, thanks for having me on your show. I love it. I am um, a junkie. Uh, I, I told you before we got on the air that I've been binge watched all of them. So each one has been so special and I love that you capture the person, uh, which is so nice. So anyways, I could go on and on. But, <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think the most surreal thing for me about this book was uh, walking into a store and seeing it for the first time. Um, you know, it's been with me for so long and it's been part of my journey for the last decade that, um, you know, as I experience something, I think, oh, that emotion is similar to what I went through then. Let's write that down. Let's jot that down. Maybe I'm listening to, I would listen to Hockey Night in Canada um, and I would hear you guys say words and I would think, oh, that word is really profound or that word really really describes what I was thinking and I couldn't find the word at the time. So, um, you know, now that that is done, it's strange. It's strange to have a different sort of perspective on life that I'm not always gathering this data. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know how kids are. We walked into the store and my daughter is like, why is your face in the bookstore? <laughs> so that certainly puts you back into perspective and humbles you. <laughs> Is this something that you could have put out there a decade ago? Because it does feel very raw and honest and, and vulnerable. Um, have you always been kind of in a position where you could have put that out there or does it take being in a certain place in your life to do that? So, I mean, I think of a couple things. This book for me could have only been published now in the way that it is, in the format that it is. Um, when I first started writing it, I work as a professional speaker, um, so I speak from the stage and a lot of my peers within the speaking world have a book and they sell it at the back of the room and they sell it for 20 bucks and then you make a little bit more money than when you first came in. So that was kind of my idea was a business venture. But as I was writing the book, I realized that the stories were bigger than me. They were um, 
about a time in, in women's hockey and women's sport that is not well documented. Hmm. Um, I even found it difficult finding a lot of the historical references, the data. Um, and so it took me a long time to really get the stories right. And um, in the beginning, my first draft, I got it all out on paper. And I realized that I was a terrible writer. <laughs> so um, I went back and I took some classes. And I think one thing about goaltending is that uh, the era that I played in changed so dramatically from skate saves to reverse VHs. I mean, it was just like night and day, but it taught me um, to be okay with not being the best in the room, to be okay mm. with um, learning new things. And so that really helped me when I went back, I took some courses on how to write. Um, you know, I think this book couldn't have been written by somebody currently on the national team, couldn't have been released. It certainly could have been written. Um, because when you're on the national team, there's this fear. Um, there's this fear of place on the team. There's this fear of um, somebody's going to take your spot. You don't want to uh, be too far out of line. You don't want to say the wrong things. You don't want to uh, make the wrong people mad because somebody else is going to replace you. And so mm -hmm. I don't think that this could have been done in that era when I played on the team. Um, and the same thing with the Furies. I think continuing to play as a professional into my 40s, just meant that I was busy. It just meant that, you know, having a family and still playing professional hockey while having a full-time job and a, a, an Olympian husband um, meant that there just wasn't really the time. And it really took a demise of an entire league, the CWHL, mm -hmm. for me <laughs> to have time and for right. me to be able to, you know, get this manuscript off my shelf. My daughter started kindergarten. Um, and so I think for me, it was just the right time. Um, but also the the words perhaps could not have been said while I was in the job per se. Well, you cycle through so many, but I think one of the most compelling for me was the role you played as a goaltender on the national team uh, and dealing with the sort of tandem or the trio situation and the, the complexities of that, you know, being the starter, not being the starter, being the third. Um, how, how do you, how do you reconcile? I mean, how do you work with that? You know, with with Kim St. Pierre and Charlene Levante, people that you love, yet you're competing for this role. It's, I mean, it's it's sort of this incredible dance from the outside to watch. But I have to imagine that it's very painful at times. Yeah, I mean, you're right. It is. It's. It was hard. Um, I'm. I'm so lucky that they are such incredible people, and both Charlie and Kim are. Um, incredibly strong, resilient, humble, uh, with this incredible work ethic. So, um, you know, it could have been much, much harder if that was not the case, but never a bad word was said between us. Um, but I often envied and was jealous of their position. And in this book, I didn't want it to be inauthentic. I wanted that to be real because I think that those feelings as, as humans are real. And I think that that's the human experience that, um, you know, how do you, how do you rectify that just juxt, juxtaposition that you want your team to be successful, but you don't want your team to possibly be able to go on without you. Right. And, you know, we all go through those moments. It could be in a workplace environment. It could be in your family environment. It could be in a sporting endeavor. It could be in journalism. Somebody else gets the scoop. You don't get it. Trying to build them up is hard because, um, you know, trying to support them as they're going for the championship was hard because if they fail, I get to go. It becomes my turn. And so you kind of always have these emotions going on within you. And I wanted that to be real. I had to rewrite a lot of those stories so that um, I didn't come across as, as fake and I just all of a sudden got over it or I just magically learned this amazing lesson because that's not life. Well, and one of the the moments you you touch upon with such vulnerability is 2002 and, and not being able to to be on the ice for for that medal. Um, but how do you look back on that team now? Because th that when I you know when I interview anybody from the national team currently, and we talk about where their inspiration came from, that was it. I mean, that was that 2002 team changed everything that Olympics. I, I mean, I agree. I think in 1998, um, we played in the middle of the night. It was the first Olympic women's hockey tournament. So that was incredibly special. For me, that team was um, 
we had some rookies on the team, but we had the head. So we had some women who had fought for this right for women's hockey to be in the Olympics. And so we had these incredible role models and mentors, um, such as Francine Saint Louis, such as Stacy Wilson, Angela James, who I know didn't end up making the team, but um, you know, was there for me and um, Geraldine Heaney, Manon Rayon, Leslie Redden, some of the biggest names in the game. Um, so I think being a part of that was so special because it was the first. And looking back now, how many years later, um, one of the moments that stands out for me is actually Cami Granato getting the first women's gold medal. And it, you know, while it was hard at the time and it was not what we wanted, um, that moment still stands out in history for me because that happened. It was there. And as a little girl, I could have never envisioned that that could have even been a possibility. So to be a part of that was special. But then fast forward to Salt Lake City, suddenly we're playing in prime time. And so now I think we were exposed to a whole new generation of people, um, specifically young girls, but also their families. So now people saw us play that had never seen women's hockey before. The fact that it was such a close final and so many people I think were throwing things at their television set because of the refereeing that game. Um, <laughs> I, I think that that really made a difference to allow more girls to play. So dads for the first time saw these amazing women on TV and were like, oh, maybe, maybe my daughter can play too. Um, mothers were like, I want my daughter to be out there with them. You know, th these girls are role models and mentors. And um, so I think that really did change the perspective that people had for women's hockey in this country. Um, and we saw it in a surge in registrations after the fact. You speak so beautifully about all of your various relationships with your friends and your family and your teammates. And I, I wanna talk about your probably most valuable teammate and that's Billy, your, your husband, um, who is arguably the greatest sledge hockey player to ever play the game. I think so. I mean, I'm pretty much. <laughs> uh, he came along at, at kind of a crossroads for you. What did he restore in you at the time when you needed him most? Hmm. You know, we often, um, we often laugh at people that are very open in the public eye about their love for each other. But through this book, I have been asked about that. And it's, you know, it's not easy to talk for me to talk about those emotions publicly. Um, but I think when it comes to him, he allowed me to be me. And I had never really had that before. I was always looking to be somebody else or looking to play a role that I thought was maybe what's supposed to be, you're supposed to be like in a relationship. I'm so fortunate that I found him um, and I love that now I get to live vicariously through his dreams. I get to support him um, and almost as my parents did for me and I, I can now allow him to be the best that he can be to just be a full-time sledge hockey player. I think that's all that athletes um, uh, really want is to be able to do your your job professionally and allowing him to do that um, has been just so amazing and fulfilling for me um, but also to support somebody else as athletes I think we're so selfish in our in our pursuits you have to be to get to the top levels um, but being in this role now is a new role for me and something that I'm I'm proud to um, pursue and to play and now we have this daughter who um, hates hockey. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, you know, I think for the longest time, hockey took mom and dad out of the house. And exactly so, right. we have, yeah, we have this little uh, amazing uh, girl who is super athletic, uh, is probably going to be built like a linebacker like me, uh, but loves to dance and loves to do pirouettes and um, is just the most amazing little being. You talk about you know growing up playing boys hockey and your time with Stanford and the taunts that you you took um I mean how do you how do you play through that you know when you're a 13 year old girl say on a boys team and parents are yelling nasty stuff at you um and and I, yeah not that not to say that that girls uh, don't endure that to this day but I would hope not to the same level yeah you know I I think for women of a certain generation or maybe even growing up in certain areas in this country, you know, still have to deal with that on, on, uh, in their workplace environment. Um, but I don't know, you know, I, I was able to play hockey because my parents signed me up and 
I think having two people that believed that I could play made all the difference. You know, two people that um, it didn't matter what anybody else said. And they, they themselves didn't grow up in the hockey culture, um, but they suffered the brunt of the criticism. I mean, they were the ones that had to endure other people in the stands yelling at me. Um, and I often didn't hear it. You know, in hockey, you get to be behind the glass, which is great, you know? And um, so maybe, you know, I, I'm often asked this, you know, how did it not bother you? And I just always felt like I got to play. I was, I was one of the fortunate ones that got to play and that so many of my peers didn't have this opportunity. And I think, you know, being the only girl or being different in anything can go two ways. One is it can push you out because you feel like you don't belong. You don't see yourself in it. On the other hand, you could see it as an opportunity to show that you, your background, your ethnicity, your gender can do X, Y, or Z. And I think I took it that way. And I, I'm not sure why. I mean, it's not like my parents were motivational speakers to me all the time. Rah, rah, you can do this. Um, but I think any setbacks that I had or, you know, I talk one time in the book about being cut from a boys team and being devastated. I mean, being, feeling like this, my, my NHL, my NHL prospects were now over. That's what I felt like, you know, at 10 years old. Um, but to even think in my mind that that was a possibility, um, meant that I had grown up in this environment of strength. Um, I have to wrap it up because I'm going to drive our editors insane because I can talk to you forever. So oh, sorry. I mean, <laughs> no, it's not. It's not you. It's me. Um, I'll leave you with the question that we leave all of our guests with. And that is, what is your best advice for a young Sammy Joe Small? So I've seen a lot of your podcasts and I knew this question was coming and <laughs> it doesn't make it any easier. I, you know, everybody had such a diverse answer and I loved all the different answers. And I almost want to say, I want that one. I want this one. Um, but I think, you know, I, I was trying to think about my life back then, what I needed to hear. And, um, you know, I, I just was very lucky that I had this amazing family and this amazing sport support network of teammates, a lot of them guys, um, and mentors that um, allowed me to be me. And so, you know, I think a young Sammy Joe, all the challenges and obstacles, I would tell her that um, this is going to make a really great story someday. And to just live it, to just enjoy it and live it and the ups and downs, um, just go with it because um, someday in a book, it's going to be really good. Um, the other thing I think is to to have been try to try to be more inclusive. I think that um, it wasn't really until the conversations began in the last couple months um, that I had to really stop myself to think. You know, could I have been, done more? Could I have learned more? And I was uh, very privileged to have gone to a, a French immersion high school where uh, we had many Métis teachers and. Um, had perhaps more of a cultural understanding than most in this country, but that doesn't even begin to scratch the surface. And having visited a lot of communities across this country, I think the voice of our Indigenous people needs to be heard louder and clearer, and more people need to have an understanding of the challenges and the, um, the history there so that we can all be more empathetic, but also move forward together. And, um, you know, I've learned so much about just even changes in my life that are positive from that cultural experience. I want everybody to have that ability. I appreciate that so much. I appreciate you so much. Uh, Sammy Joe Small, thank you for this. Well, thank you, Tara. I really appreciate it.